you've had a great week this week, and I uh, hope you've come this morning to to worship the Lord. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And uh, we want to honor and glorify Him and invite His Holy Ghost presence into this place as one with us. And if you came to to uh, see me or to see anybody who prayed for me this morning, you came for the wrong reason anyway. We want because we're going we're going to try to show you Jesus. Um, we did. We tried to talk to Matthew and let him know that Jesus didn't wear his hair like that. And um, but um, he did. Does have a great hairstylist, and uh, that's she's in our church. We want to know somebody can do make miracles. She ain't even paying no attention, but her husband is. He'll tell him. And uh, if if y'all need a good hairstylist, need somebody to, to look after you and all, uh, Miss Regina, if she can make Matthew look good, she can make anybody look good. <laughs> and, uh, so just say it. And uh, but. Uh, we're thankful for what God's doing. We'd like to invite you this week. There's events um, we're doing today. Uh, we had the Mudcats game today at 2. Um, <clears throat> if you are riding a van or need a ride, uh, please see myself and Ron. We're trying to see if somebody from here in this area drive the van. Um, he lives in Kinley. I live in Nashville. By the time we get back, we've got to go to Bailey and things too after the game. So uh, by the time we get back and all, uh, if somebody in this area wants to drive the van, that'd be great. Um, that's, that's going. We do have uh, free tickets. The way they work though is we have 17 of these right here. And so each one of these gets five people into the game. So we got plenty of tickets for everybody. We just need to make sure that everybody groups up and everything too. So if you got a family of five or whatever, we'll give you one of these and you just use that to get in the game. Uh, the game does start at 2 o'clock. If you get there a little late, we'll probably be arriving a few minutes late, but that's fine too. We'll just all try to get together once we get to the game and sit there together. Uh, with that, they are playing Myrtle Beach today, and so, uh, and in case you didn't know, that the Mudcats this year switched to the Braves affiliation. They finally got it right after all these years. Um, they're, they're the single A advanced team, or I think it's the single A advanced for the Braves, which is God's team, and um, now they used to be 2A. They switched, when, when Kenston moved up to here, they, they switched to 1A, and so I think it's 1A advanced, but anyway, they, um, um, we're looking forward to that. And don't forget, right after the service this morning, if you're on building the grounds, um, I just saw one of our members come in for building the grounds. And, uh, and so if you're on building the grounds with your deacon, we we're meeting right after the service this morning just for a few minutes to address a couple of issues we've got that we need to get taken care of um, building-wise and things too. So that's why we're having that meeting this morning. Um, also, there'll be a finance committee meeting coming up on the 31st. Um, our church softball team plays tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. It plays Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. I know the 9 o'clock games are hard to make for people and everything. Our crowds have been great, honestly. Um, and, uh, but if you um, would like to uh, come out and join us, that's fine, too. I know I see a couple of faces, too, that, that, uh, that are here this morning that uh, have been coming some recently. I know they play ball. Uh, we could use some, too, and uh, we, we, we would invite everybody. We, uh, those 9 o'clock games especially are tough. I know for a fact this, this week... Uh, Coming up um, next week, actually, uh, Ron and myself will be gone. Brandon and Elias will be gone, and uh, a couple others. So that puts us down to right at, I think, 11. So, um, and then a couple, more, one or two other people does have to work or anything so like that happens, and it puts us down to right at 10. So, um, even though we might have 16 or 17 on the team, uh, we still everybody. We've been back to everybody. We're going to continue to do that until God changes it. And I don't think He's changed it. I don't think He's going to. So, uh, if you'd like to see us, see us. We'll try to get you a shirt. Um, but we, uh, we added a new member to our staff this week, too, in softball. Uh, Mr. Charles, actually, is our, is our first base coach. Uh, we brought him on staff this week at a salary of $110,000 to coach first base. So. Oh, I forgot to tell you about that. <laughs> I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, we, uh, we've had a blast this week. And uh, I will tell you this. Uh, Stanley said to us this week, and a couple others in our crowd said to us this week, it was the worst beating we've had ever uh, this week since we've been playing. Uh, and during the game, after the, he said, I can tell you one thing, our whole team is definitely going to heaven. And, uh, and, and I was like, I know that. I, I hope you are, he said, because they beat the hell slam out of us. So we're definitely going to go to heaven. We lost 42 to 6 on, on, on Thursday night. And so, uh, was it Thursday night? Thursday, Thursday night. Yeah, 42 to 6 Thursday night. And... Uh, so anyway, we do have a new strategy the next time we play that team and uh, just to trip them all and, and untie our shoes and tie them together and everything else and all that too. But, uh, but anyway, they, that, that team's been playing for years together and they took the two best teams, took the best ones off of it, put it together. 
So, but they, I'll be honest with you, they weren't jerks about it. It was really cool. They prayed with us at the end over our trip coming up, and uh, they, they quit running on us. They gave us outs, and, uh, and they still beat us 42 to 6. So, we're, we're thankful. Yeah, it was 42 to 6. So, we're thankful for what God gave us grace and mercy in that. So, don't forget the care meal is this Wednesday night at 5 30 here. And, um, and the, uh, the care ministry will start at 6.15. That's where we're writing cards and things too. So if you want to sign up for the care meal, uh, please sign up out there so we know how much food to have for this Wednesday night. And uh, if you don't, not for me with what care is, uh, care is we want to care about the people of our community and the people in our church and the people in outreach to people uh, for teachers and law enforcement and firefighters and, uh, and government workers and things too. We want to send them cards and just encourage them. Uh, people that have visited our church in the live crucifixion scene, we send out cards to them uh, during that time and pray for them over those times. And then also, too, um, they actually will have a meal at 530 before that uh, for adults. It's $4. Children 16 and under, I think it is. It's $2. You can't feed them cheaper than that. So Daddy, Daddy cooks the food, and so we'll have... I'll furnish that meal and it won't cost much money. Okay, well, that'll be good, too. So... We'll, we'll, we'll look at that too then. But if you would sign up so we know as many how, how to prepare for that too. So, okay. Um, any other announcements anybody knows of? The youth will be in the, in the sanctuary in the Sunday school and Wednesday night. The ne Wednesday night, yeah, the next two weeks, the youth will be in here during Sunday school and on Wednesday nights they'll be meeting in here to practice for youth Sunday. And so uh, the, the adults will be meeting in the, in the fellowship hall for Bible study over the next couple of Wednesday nights and also on for uh, Sunday school. Nobody makes it here anyway. So just know that if you're coming in or if you got somebody coming in at second service and they're coming in a little early or whatever, know they're in your practice for that too for you Sunday. Be praying prayer for them. I know they're putting a lot of hard work into that too. And so uh, we want to uh, praise the Lord for what he's doing. He's an awesome God. Amen. For us to come forth at this time, we'll take up this house in our heart.
passed by, she still hasn't seen the Instagram, but we passed by Mount Herman Missionary Baptist Church of Science, and it said 11 a.m. Sunday, Boils, and it said B-O-I-L-S. So I took a picture of it and I sent it to them and I said, are y'all supposed to be here? I said, they, they, if you are, don't go because they can't even spell y'all's name right. <laughs> I said, I couldn't pass. I love to look at church signs. And I thought, and the boy said, what are they putting that on there for? I said, well, I guess it could be from the boils that, that Job had, you know, when his skin broke out. And I said, but I said, I got to send that to Lord Eddie and tell them they don't have to spell my name right. So don't be going there. They're welcome y'all. They don't even go. They can't even spell your name right. Uh, this time, it's a great man of coming this morning. And You'll stand to your feet with us as we worship in song this morning. Uh, let your heart be free this morning. And, and, and we've already prayed already uh, for the Holy Ghost feeling in this place. And uh, we want to uh, open our hearts and minds this morning to worship Him as if Jesus was standing right in front of you this morning. Free yourself this morning. Every, everything off your mind this morning except for worshiping the Most High God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for all that you do. We ask, Lord, over these next few minutes, Lord, as we worship you in song. God, that you would pour out your spirit upon this place this morning. Oh God, that people would see you and not us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
you know what? Uh, no matter what we face or what we're going through or where we're at in our life, we can always run to Jesus. And I love that it says that His His um, His grace is sufficient. His mercy is awesome. He loves us as His children so much that His riches are enough. Do you get that this morning? All the money in the entire world um, can't take its place. Uh, the riches that man looks to today, um, I, I can tell you that uh, in my own life, I'm, I'm guilty many times of it as looking to my own self for, for uh, the things of this world and what the world has to offer. And every time I do, I always stay. Um, my God is so gracious. He's so merciful, and, and I am rich, absolutely rich in Him. You see, the splendor of heaven, uh, no one can compare to that. And nothing on this earth can compare to that, and I know where I'm going. Uh, we were joking about that the other night in, in our game, that the other team beat the, the hell out of us, so we wouldn't go to hell, we'd go to heaven. Uh, so there's no hell in us, but uh, truthfully, that is the truth, for real. I know where I'm going. I know the grace of his love and his mercy in my own life. And uh, I can tell you this, if he can change my life and save my life, he can save anybody's life. And that's what he did. He died on the cross that all might be saved. Um, that all might know him, that all might uh, glorify him, that all might honor him. And, and um, he's, he's amazing. And you are absolutely, at your poorest times financially, you're rich because you got Jesus. When the world is out there that we live in, it doesn't can't turn on your, on your TV without seeing that our world is turning their back on God. Uh, they're turning to everything else and, and, and that's not the answer. The answer is not in the bottom of a liquor bottle. The answer is not in the, in the bottom of a, of, a, of a dime bag of pop. It's not in the bottom of a, of a, of a hit of crack. It's, it's in Jesus. And uh, that He is the greatest thing ever. And uh, I can tell you, I am high. I'm high as a kite on Jesus, and I ain't never coming off this side. Uh, and you can't rob me of that because you didn't give it to me. Amen? Uh, the Creator did. So I'm thankful for what He's done in my life. I know what He's doing in this church. Uh, this is His church. We can be everything to Him. It's His, His awesomeness, uh, what He wants to do in our lives. And I'm thankful, so thankful for that. The children that go out with their teachers at this time, and, um, as they go to children's church, the ones that would like to, turning your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 4. We're returning back to Acts. If you don't have your Bibles with you, it's fine. It's there on the screen behind me. I do ask you this week, um, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, to pray for us to safe travel. Ron and myself and my family will be leaving Thursday to fly out to Israel. And, um, Crystal, you know, as you may not know, that she's never flown before, and so she's pretty apprehensive about it. So if you would keep her in your prayers. Um, I said I'm a little bit apprehensive. But I got to be the man, so I put Abby beside her so she could squeeze Abby's arm. And um, so, um, and Abby could probably calm her down. Where if I said it's okay, but she'd probably say, "Shut up, shut up." And uh, she told me this week she said I'll probably be sitting there the whole time tears are streaming down my face when people try to talk to me I'll probably say don't say that I'm talking to Jesus don't say that to me I'm talking to Jesus <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we figured we'd break it in right we never flown we fly to Newark, New Jersey um, first thing it's about an hour and 40 minute flight and then we leave out of there and fly to Israel it's about an 11 hour flight uh, to Israel so um, looking forward to seeing what God's doing honestly there's a, a Jewish holiday while we're there called Shabbat um, you can look it up um, the lady that is in the hotel we're staying at is actually in the church that I'll be preaching at that Sunday morning. And um, dear sweet lady, she's a, she's American and she's trying to uh, pray for her. Her name's Patricia. She's trying to learn the business of, of hotels there to open up a, a mission house there for uh, a hostel. A hostel is what they call it, like a hostess house is here at Bed and Breakfast. And um, she wants to open that up for so that Christian missionaries can come over from the United States, have a place to stay and things and, and to witness. And uh, even though that is the uh, Holy Land, as they call it, if you, 
you know anything about that, you know an Orthodox Jew only believes in the first five books of the Bible. And so that's what they're celebrating. Shavuot actually um, means a, a festival of weeks. And um, so they're doing seven weeks after the Passover it starts. And it, it'll be that Saturday, Sunday, Monday when we get there. And um, they actually will have, what they do is they, they read the first five books. They're celebrating the, the Torah, giving them the Torah from Moses on Mount Sinai. That's the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And as they believe in that, and so they've actually created a book called the Tikkun, um, T-I-K-K-U-N, that they put the scriptures from the Old Testament in, and they actually stay up all night long and read that. And uh, and then they read the Book of Ruth, and uh, as they read that, they, they celebrate with a lot of dairy products. And the lady, Patricia, said, by the way, cheesecake is one of them, and uh, yum yum. I was like, amen, yum yum. So I told Andy last night, I said, I wonder if I can go there and get some New York cheesecake in Israel. If not, we might have to teach them that. So New York cheesecake in Israel, but Looking forward to that, and uh, she, but what really got me about that was this: when she said they stayed up all night long reading the scripture, and I thought, you know what? They don't believe the Messiah's come yet, and we believe He has, and we believe and know uh, without a shadow of a doubt that He's sent the Holy Spirit here. That's what knocks on your heart. That's what tugs at your heartstrings. That's what makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you think it's in your conscience, say it's your conscience. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you saying, hey, you don't need to be doing what you're doing or hey, you're doing right. Keep on that track. That's the encouragement that we need. And, and, and being as they don't believe that, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, with us, we got it. And I thought, I was so convicted when I heard that, I thought, when's the last time we stayed up all night long reading scripture? And, and you know, if that hits you this morning, it hit me even harder as a pastor. When's the last time we stayed up all night long just reading scripture? celebrate that and um, this goes right along in, on the Christian calendar with Pentecost the week of Pentecost and things goes on while we're there and so I'm looking forward to that I don't know what you what you believe or how you believe in the Holy Ghost but uh, Jesus said he had to leave and go uh, to send the Holy Ghost here with us to lead God and direct us and direct our paths and that's how God promised us he'd never leave us nor forsake us and so that's why when when you come to church on Sunday morning I was sharing with a man yesterday I uh, had the opportunity to pray for him and his family. I didn't realize the things that they had really been through all together. Um, many of you may remember Warren Sneak Lewis. He was a deputy in Nash County that was killed in the line of duty. Um, his father, I met, met him and talked to him yesterday. He runs a, a uh, motor company in, in um, Middlesex and does a tow truck service. Where his brother came with him yesterday um, to help him tow a truck. And, um, and when he did, I looked at the back window and it had Carlton um, Lewis and it, it was a young guy, junior, and he was born at 77. I thought, man, that's my wife's age. And, and it showed when he passed was about, I guess, six or seven years ago, if not a little more. And um, I was like, man, doggone, he suffered some great loss. And so I asked him, I said, you know, I know about Sneak, but I said, Carlton, he was like, that was actually my brother's child. Um, he had cancer, he passed away in his 20s. And I thought, man, you know what? Um, they, they both suffered great loss. <coughs> And I, I said to him yesterday, I said, you know, uh, we were talking, and he, he actually said to me one of the fam fam famous sayings that a lot of people say to me, you don't act like a preacher. I said, what's a preacher supposed to act like? Uh, tell me about what he's supposed to act like. Um, I said, I had a man tell me one time that you don't need to tell people where you've been, you don't need to tell people what you did, because they need to see you as up here. But let me tell you something this morning I want to share with you. The minute that you see a preacher up here, quit going to that church. Because he puts his pants on just like you do one leg at a time. He's a man just like you are. He fails just like you do. And, and, and you don't. You shouldn't come to church to see that preacher anyway. You should come to church to see Jesus. We come to church to worship him. And you know, it's not about us at all. It's, forever. it's all about him. And I want to share with you this morning as we, we look in the scripture of seeking the will of God. I believe this is what he would have us to title it. Seeking his will because his will is so much greater than ours. He knows what the future holds. He knows what the next five minutes hold. He knows what the next day holds in your life. He knows what the next ten years holds in your life. He knew that today I would be standing in the pulpit preaching long before I did. And yes, it's still, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you can ask many people that knew me before, that when I tell them, they're like, you're a preacher? I was like, listen, if, if it, it shocks you, it, should, it shouldn't shock you because it shocks me every day. Every day I wake up and I'm going, really, man? You really have, let me tell you something, God definitely has a sense of humor. 
And I promise you he does. If you don't believe me, look in the mirror when you get home today. Everybody with me? <laughs> that was a joke, by the way, because y'all are beautiful. Turn in scriptures with me, if you would, and let's look at the beginning of verse 23. It says, as soon as they were free, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. Do you hear that with me? When they heard the report, all of the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through, your, through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with feudal plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas and Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, by the way, which is us, by the way. Gentile, if we're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. I don't know if any Jews here in this congregation, so we're all Gentiles. And the people of Israel were all united against Jesus. Yeah, you might say, you can stop right there. You might say, well, that wasn't me. I wasn't there back then. Yes, thank God we weren't there back then. But I just wanted you to know, when we think for one minute that, you know what, we didn't, we didn't do that. Yes, we did. The sin in our life put Jesus on the cross. Amen? And the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. I want to stop right here for a minute. This tells you and I that everything that happens in our life was already determined beforehand. He's already gone before us. The problems that we walk in tomorrow at work or in our life or in our marriage or in our, in our homes and our families, He's already in the midst of it. He's already, he's already there right in the midst of it. He knows exactly what you're going to go through. And He promised you He would carry you through that. For His word says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Well, there's times in my life where I thought, God, where are you, man? Really? Where, where are you at? You know what? I was, I was reminded this week. When I feel the furthest away from God, I'm the one that moved. I'm the one that moved. Because He's the solid rock. He's the foundation. <laughs> he determined beforehand according to your will. And now, our Lord, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they preached the word of God with boldness. You know, this is where I really believe and God's really convicted me this week that why is the church failing me? Why, why is the church going through so much turmoil? Why is there so much rift inside the church? I really believe it's because of that last thing. It's because there's too much sugar-coated preaching going on today. You see, it's not my opinion that, that changes your life. My opinion will lead you to hell. It's the Word of God that changes my life, that changes your life, that molds us and makes us. It is powerful. The Word of God is powerful, filled with the Holy Spirit, written by the, by the Holy Spirit, written by God Himself as He revealed the words to pin down through His Holy Spirit. God-inspired Word. It's His Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Meaning Jesus existed from the very beginning of time, and He is the Word. Hide the words of God in your heart that you might not sin against thee. Why? Because when sin faces us, and we're hit with sin in our mouth, and we don't know this right here, then we're, we're going to fall. We're going to fall into what the world wants us because we don't know how to fight it. How did Jesus fight when the devil came against him and tempted him in the wilderness? With what? Scripture. Hold on, he's Jesus. Could he have just said, get away from me, you idiot, and be gone and vanish? Yeah, he could have. But what did he do? He, he fought against him with Scripture. That's what he expects us to do too. May God bless the reading of his Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask for these next few minutes, Lord God, that you would be with us. God, I pray that your, your word be heard this morning. We'd apply it to our lives when we would seek your will out of our own. Because God, you know best. We thank you for all that you do. It's in your mighty son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we look at verses 23 through 26, we see first the believer's actions. And, and, and they share with others what they learn. You know, this is one of the things I, I remember when I first went to the fire department, one of the things that was said about uh, this is that people didn't want you to know as much as they do because they, they were threatened by you if you did. They didn't want to teach you what they knew. You ever been in a job where, where you, you actually, you go into your job and, and you're new to it and you, you get training and people don't want to tell you really what the whole training is. They just want to teach you enough just so you can just get by. And they don't want to teach you that because they don't want you to know as much as they know and then you make it look bad. Right? Well, well see what happened here was Peter and John, they were on trial, remember? And, and they, they told him, they said, hey, I want to just bring you back to speed where we're at in Acts. As they go through, they, they were going on, on trial, and they were preaching. They had just healed the beggar at the gate. Remember all this? They had just healed the beggar at the gate. And, and all of a sudden, they called in before the great religious leaders who, who are religious. That's why I told you I'm not religious at all whatsoever. I don't believe in religiosity. I believe in Christianity. And it's about Christ himself. Like, you can be the most religious person you can be and die and go to hell. That's what the religious people were. They were so religious that they called Peter and John in and said, Listen, you need to stop healing in Jesus' name. You need to stop doing all these things. And they were like, do you think he would rather us listen to you? Or do you think he'd rather us listen to him? And so they realized that they couldn't refute what had happened. They couldn't refute that the healing and the miraculous things had taken place. They couldn't refute the fact that God is powerful and he was using them, his servants. Amen? God still uses his servants, right? And so he wants to use us. He wants us all to be his servants. And he wants to use us. And, and so what they did was <clears throat> they came back from the trial. And the scripture says, as soon as they were free, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and the elders had said. They shared what they had learned. They shared what they had been told. And I can imagine them walking back up and going, hey, y'all are other believers with us. Okay, we're together in this thing. And they told me to quit doing what God told me to do. And I just looked at them and laughed and said, Really? You mean to tell me you want me to do what you want me to do and you think that God wants me to stop doing what he wants me to do so I can do what you want me to do? <clears throat> you know, I think that's what we need to look at the world today and say. That's why I believe as a pastor, God didn't call me to please you as people. He called me to please him. I don't mean that disrespectfully by any means. But God didn't call me to tickle your ears. God didn't call you to tickle people's ears in your family. And You know, I, I was convicted, I shared with you recently and in, in my biological father, I was convicted to, to keep texting him and tell him, hey, just show the love. What would Jesus do? No matter what's happened in our life and in our relationship, the, the, Jesus is so grace and full of grace and mercy that he's floated into my life and changed my life and it's vertically done to me that I need to horizontally give that to everybody else. I shared with a friend of mine this week, he, his daughter had some things going on and she, she didn't do everything she told him she was going to do and all oh, they were mad at her on ground and things and I thought, man, I would actually learn under this guy's ministry. And so I texted him yesterday and I said, hey, just remember all the grace and mercy you give to the church people that are mean to you and hateful to you, give that same ones to your daughter. <laughs> I had to learn that myself. I mean, you know who I'm talking about back there. I had to learn that for myself. They said, you're really hard on Seth. You need to, maybe you need to back off a little bit. I see it on you. It wasn't what I wanted to hear, honestly. I wanted to say, look, I'm going to be hard on him. He's me a man. Then I had to realize, you know what? I am to discipline him. I am to train him. I am to teach him respect. I am to teach him obedience. But at the same time, I need to teach him that his daddy loves him. I need to show him that love. I need to show him that forgiveness. And, you know, it's so easy for us to give, forgive other people. But sometimes our family and, and our friends, it's hardest for us to forgive because we've hurt us so much. I want to share with you this morning. Go back and share with everyone what you learned. Because when you learn something in Scripture... And I can tell you this for real. I've read it through and through several times and I still learn stuff when I read it. I'm like, dang, man, that's good. That, that is really, 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 really good. I, this wasn't even, a, this wasn't even a, uh, out of the scripture, but I will tell you this. I learned yesterday, and we're not talking about that this morning, but I just want to bring it to you to extra, no extra cost. God doesn't like the sin of homosexuality. I mean... He doesn't like the sin of homosexuality. The Bible says it's an abomination unto him, which means it makes him sick. He does love the homosexual. He doesn't like what the homosexual does. And someone said, I heard yesterday, not even, not even in a Christian sermon, wasn't even a sermon or anything, I just heard this comedian say, you know what? If you hate somebody because of the color of their skin, or you hate somebody because they're homosexual, you hate somebody because that's not adding anything to your life. 
Why don't you learn something about them, get to know them, and then hate that stuff about them then that you don't really like? Don't hate them just because of what they are and who their identity is. And I thought, man. And he said, and by the way, by the way, which we know as, as Christian people that God is the one who creates a man and woman, right? God is the one who gives, breathes life into a baby being born. But here's what he said. He said, because don't be mad at the gay person because it took straight people to make them. I've never seen two gay people actually have a baby. Have you? Never seen two gay people get pregnant. Have you? I thought, man, you know what? That's the truth. He was like, two mad at straight people to make them. No, let's love on them. Because I can tell you this, I've seen God change a person that was gay too. Now I'm not telling them I condone their sin and not that. Oh, I'm all for that. Yeah, buddy, come on. Woo-hoo. No, I'm not. I'm 100 man. I was a marine. Okay, I'm still a marine, and I still 100 man. I do. I do not agree and do not condone the sin of homosexuality. But can I tell you this? That sin is no greater than the sin in mind in your life, and we gossip about something to somebody in church. I mean, whether you like it or not, regardless, I don't like a child molester. Okay, I, I got no respect for that at all whatsoever, honestly. Physically and fleshly, I don't. But that's no greater sin than us going out and slandering somebody, that's, somebody else that's in our family or our church or whatever else. There's no greater sin. The Bible says sin is sin. Amen? The only unforgivable sin is blasphemy, which means to deny God, because how can He forgive you of your sin when you don't even acknowledge who He is? That's what blasphemy means. So share with others what we mean. Listen to what He says next. Pray together. Lifting our voices. The greatest concentration of power in Jerusalem that day was in the prayer meeting that followed the trial of Peter and John. This is one of the truly great prayers recorded in the Bible. And it is a good example for us to follow today. To begin with, it was a prayer that was born out of witness and service for the Lord. Peter and John had just come in from the trenches. And the church met to pray in order to defeat the enemy. I want to share something with you. I thought it was powerful. And as I pinned this down, I thought to myself, man, God, thank you for giving this to me because we really need to grab a hold of this as a church today. If more of God's people were witnessing for Christ in daily life, that means every day being a witness for Him, representing heaven right like we're supposed to, there would be more urgency and blessing when the church meets for prayer. It was a united prayer meeting as they, what did they say? Lifted up all their voices together in one accord. They were all together. I told y'all God likes Hondas. And they were in one accord. And so they were lifting up their voices all together in prayer. And as they prayed together, there was unity in prayer. No, they, they didn't all have the same opinion, did they? Did they say that they all had the same opinion? No. They all had the same purpose. And the same purpose was to unite in prayer to see God change things. And then we're asking them. So we wonder today, what's wrong in the church? It's because we expect everybody to have the same opinion we do. And we think that, oh, that's not, that's just... That's 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 this this discord in the church when everybody doesn't agree with have saying we're not going to. If you got more than one person, you got more than one opinion, and you know what opinions are like, right? They're like these rear ends. Okay, everybody's got one, and some people got two, and they wear them on their shoulders, right? <laughs> the opinions don't matter. The word of God changes their life, and when it, when you pray and ask God, prayer and supplication, it changes things according to the scripture. I don't know how to witness to my friend. I don't know how to talk to my, my family. I don't know if there's something going on in my family. It's a battle going on right now. I don't know how to break through that. Pray. Pray. The greatest thing you can do for anybody is to pray for them. Because God can change anyone. Trust me, I'm living proof of it. They gathered together their voices and prayed. The people were of one heart and one mind. And God was pleased to answer their request. Division in the church always hinders prayer and robs the church of spiritual power. Did, did you hear that? Amen. Oh, my gosh. That's good. We didn't pay the light bill. <laughs> the generator just kicked on us. We're good. Thank you, Chris, for installing that. Thank you. That's sharp for power. That may be a sign. There we go. There we go. We, we don't need it, amen? I'm not even, don't even worry about cutting the excuse back on. We'll probably blow it up anyway. They were praying together, lifting their voices. Next, they recognized the Lord. They recognized Him for who He is, His sovereign, creator of heaven and earth and everything in the earth. That's what that scripture said. You know when we come together to pray, we're to recognize God for really who He is? 
He takes us everywhere. Yeah. There's nothing too hard for God. I passed by a church sign yesterday and said, uh, uh, we can do all things with God. With, all, with God, all things are possible. That's the truth. With, with Him, all things are possible. Let me just tell you this. The scripture says, He won't put anything on you more than you can handle with Him. Well, why am I going through this battle right now? I don't understand why I'm going through it. I can't handle I can't handle this preacher. It's because you're not putting him in that equation. See, he will put things on you that you can't handle. But the scripture says he won't put things on you that you can't handle with him. See, when you don't have God in that situation with you, and you're not allowing him to work, and you're not asking for his will to be done more than your own, listen to what Jesus said. He, as he's crying out in, in the wilderness, what did he say? In the garden of Gethsemane, when he was praying, what did he say? Let, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. He didn't want to get on the cross. Do you understand that? He was a man just like us. He was the God man, 100% God and 100% man. He did not want to get on the cross. His flesh, who in the world would want to go, yeah, to kill me for these people? For something I've never done. You know, so when we get mad at God and when we get mad at the things we've gone through, we, we, we don't understand why. Think about something. Jesus actually suffered for something he never even did. He never sinned. But he was killed. And the only time in history that God's ever turned his back on his people was on his one and only son on the cross of Calvary. He turned his back on him for him to be killed for me and you. They, they prayed together as they lifted their voices. They recognized the Lord for who he was. And then the word of God and prayer always go together. As we look at the scripture here this morning, as they were praying with their voices, they said, O oh, sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, sea, and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against the, this Messiah. This is quoting of Psalm and 2. Psalm chapter 2 is a quote from that. Their praying was based solidly on the Word of God. In this case, Psalm chapter 2. And then John chapter 15 and verse 7 tells us this. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Do you get that with me this morning? We, we, we're like, oh, I've been praying, and oh, I've been praying, and God, you just had to answer my prayers, and you're just not doing it. Hold on a minute. Listen to what he said. If you remain in me, and my word remains in you, meaning you've got to read this, meaning you've got to remain in him, with him, together, joined together with him, meaning you're all on the same page together. I'm in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's in a relationship with me. I communicate with him by praying. He communicates with me by his word. We're in a relationship together, and everything that I ask for will be granted to me. The reason why it's not being granted to us is because we're not doing what this tells us. We just want the blessing, but we don't want to do the work. Are you with me today? Look around the world. Why is our nation in the shape it's in? Why are people not working? Why do people not have jobs? Why do people not going out? Why are we having to support everything else and all? It's because we're not willing to do the work, but we want the blessing. How many times have you heard this saying? Oh, they just here to collect the check. You ever heard that? God doesn't want us to come to church just to collect the blessing. He wants us to come to church to serve Him. He requires us to be servants of Him. You see, prayer and, and, and the Word always go together. That's why when we pray, that's why one of the things I, I try to teach my children, I'm not telling you how to pray, I'm just telling you about how I believe with all my heart that the Scripture says that sin separates us from God, right? I'm a sinner, right? You're a sinner, we're all sinners, right? So before, when I come before the, the throne of God and I really wanted to do something in my life, one of the first things I pray is, is Lord, I'm going to thank you for what He's doing. Thank you, God, for everything that you're doing in my life. And I try to remember to name things off, and I'm absent-minded, too. I have half hours. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, God, forgive me my sins. And forgive me where I failed you. Because at that very moment, my slate is wiped clean. Are you with me? And now I'm before the throne of God, and I'm not separated from him. Sin doesn't separate me anymore because of his forgiveness and his grace in my life. 
He's God. Yes. Now I'm asking Him. That is according to Scripture. Sin separates me from God. I want the sin removed. God, I'm asking you to forgive me my sin. Now I'm coming to you, petitioning your throne for you to do something in my life according to your will. Yeah. You see, that's where we get hung up to. It's according to His will. Secondly, non-believers' actions we see in verses 27 and 28. They were united against Jesus. They were united against Jesus. As Psalm 2 takes, talks about a crowning of a new king in Israel. We're reminded in this scripture that, that, uh, of that because the crowning of Jesus Christ happened by God. Jesus, I mean, God crowned him as the king of kings and lord of lords, didn't he? Yeah. Whenever a new king was crowned in Jewish custom, the vassal rulers were required to come and submit to him. But some of them refused to do this. God only laughed at their revolt. For he knew that they could never stand up against his king, Jesus. The early believers applied the message of this psalm to their own situation and identified their adversaries as Herod, Pilate, and the Romans, the Gentiles, and all the Jews. These enemies had united against Jesus, God's holy servant, that scripture says. You know the most disheartening thing, honestly, as a, as a pastor, as a Christian, is when you share Christ with somebody and they just won't give in. It's so much easier, honestly, to believe than it is not to believe. Too much has happened in history, and I can share with you, I've witnessed too much happening that is definitely the hand of God on it, for real. I wake up and look at it every day going, man, really? You, you chose me to preach your word? You chose me? Why, why do people so rebel against you, God? Why do people rebel against you? You know why? It's because we desire our own will to be done, which boils down to one word, and it starts with an S. Come on, with me, come on. Selfish. Every marital problem that you have, every family situation that you have, every argument that you have with your friends, every argument that happens in church that splits churches apart, all boils down to that one word, selfishness, which also coincides with that one word that starts with a C. What is it? C c c control. But we like being controlled, don't we? You know why we're so apprehensive about flying? It's not just because we're in a cockpit that's small and we're in a, in a, in a vessel that's so small and we're going through the air. And all. It's because we don't have control. I guarantee you, if you let Crystal get up there and fly that plane and she knew how to fly, she wouldn't be scared of stuff. When we think we're in control, we got it made. But the reason why we don't like that is because we don't have control anymore. Why do you think I have to drive where we go? I ain't out with nobody else. No, I'm sorry. I love you. But if I want to leave, I want to be able to leave. I'm finna drive. It's a control thing. It, it's, it's brand new to us, and so therefore, because of sin entered into the world, we want to be selfish, and that's exactly what happens in the church today, and we're wondering what goes on in our problems and our situations, when actually, if we're looking for the will of God to be done, we understand, God, your will be done greater than my own, and therefore, I don't have to be selfish and controlling of my life. I was teaching with a friend of mine recently, I was like, hey, <coughs> you don't need to let her rule you, dog. So this is where y'all ladies turn me off. Like, I said, you need to be like, hey, tell her what, are you ready to go? Come on, let's go. I was teasing with them. When in all actuality and honestly, the word of God says that a man is supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Yes, the Bible says that she's to submit to his authority as her husband. Hang on a minute now before you guys go, yeah, that's right. Yep. If you love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. I don't know of any woman in, 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 in here, and all you ladies, seriously, listen to me real good. If your husband loves you as Christ loves the church, and he's willing to give himself for you, and he dedicates himself to your growth in Jesus Christ, more so than his self, and more so than his selfish and controlling ways, would you not be willing to submit to him? If you're here this morning, you would be. If that was you, raise your hand if you're a lady here this morning that's married. Say, look around, look around, look around. Girls, hey, teenage girls, look around. See, that's really what it is, okay? So husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and be willing to give yourself for her. Do what he's called you to do. Treat her as the gift that God gave to you because that's what Eve was to Adam. Amen, ladies? Like a gift, not a possession. Oh, I tease all the time. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to tell you something. I told Chris, get in here, girl. Come on in. That's a lie. I just want to go in and test that right now. That's a lie. <laughs> I love her as Christ loved the church. And that's why she does it. I'm just kidding. She does. She does. I remember one of the biggest arguments we ever had over was, was a church and where we were going and what was happening and what was going on. We got, we got so caught up in our own selves and our own flesh 
that we were just ready to jump ship and run from this church to that church because of the fact is that something happened we didn't agree with. And then through prayer and supplication, I didn't feel like God was moving us and leaving us. Leaving us to leave there. I felt like it was tucking my tail between my legs and running. Now, if God's calling you to go somewhere, He's calling you to go somewhere, He's going to show you that. But don't tuck your tail between your legs and run just because of the problem. Because you know what? You're going to go to another church and you're going to unpack your problem eventually there too. And you're going to have a problem with them too. And you're just going to be a runner the rest of your life. That's why I refuse to tuck my tail between my legs and run. I'm a Marine. We don't retreat. For real, I, one of the ladies in our church, a dear sweet lady in our church, said to me Tuesday, she said, Pastor, she said, I know sometimes it's been tough for you here at this church, but I just wanted to tell you thank you and I'm glad you stuck it out. I'm glad you're sticking it out. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're here and I just want you to know that that I love you and I approve. I'm thankful for what you're doing. And I said, it ain't me that's doing it, honestly. It's God that's doing it. He's choosing to use you to do it. You know what? That is so flattering to me, not because of what the lady said, but because God chooses me. When, when, when we're united against Jesus, we're not working for him. We're working against him. And you're either for him or against him, this word of God says. Amen? They were living out God's will and not their own. Do you realize what they were doing? They were so blinded and stupefied to it, they didn't even know what they were doing. But they were doing God's will. God's will was that Jesus would come to the earth, 100% God, he would put on a fleshly robe and come. I was to share with someone this morning, they were asking, said, I don't, I don't understand the Trinity. And I was like, well, let, me, let me explain. The easiest way you can understand the Trinity, the Godhead, three in one, okay, is at the baptismal scene of Jesus. When, when, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the Bible says when he came straight way up out of the water, which means he had to be under it, when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him like a dove, which was the Holy Spirit. Amen? Descended upon him like a dove, and there was a voice from heaven that said, This is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So we see God the Father, the Spirit, of, the, the voice from heaven, This is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. We see the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him like a dove, and we see the Son, Jesus. Yes. Still God. The easiest way to understand that is this. If you're in here today and you're, you're, a, you're a mother, you have a name. For instance, Macy is her name. She's a mother. She's a wife. So there's more roles than just Macy, right? She's a mother. She's a wife. But her title is teacher when she teaches school too, right? She's still Macy. Amen? Are you with me? There's just more roles than one. He's got more roles than one, and he's still God. <laughs> they were living out the will of God and didn't know it, didn't even see it. As they were living out the will of God, when they saw the will of God being done, they will eventually, they killed him. They put Jesus on the cross and killed him. They rebelled against him. Was that God's will? Yes. yes. Hold on a minute now. They're in control and they're selfish and they put about killing him because they're looking like fools <coughs> because they're the most religious people and they're the most, look at them, they're the high priest. But Jesus comes on the scene and, and, and he's given his, his, his apostles the ability to be able to heal people. Now, why are they doing this? It's showing that Jesus is really who, who he is and he's really God. And boy, it's making them look like fools. So, so what do they do? They go and kill him. <clears throat> and that was God's plan anyway. Yeah. That was God's will anyway. Is that he died in your place. Yeah. And here's the thing is this. They were living out God's will, even though they didn't even know they were doing it. Can God use unsaved people to do his will? Yeah. You dog on. You dog on. Can God can use anybody? Right. He wants to use us and he wants us to be sold out for him. He wants us to be there. There's a song uh, that, that Lecrae does, Heaven and Hell, and he says, You got I'm sold out, I'm sold out for the kingdom. And it's, in the song he does, Heaven and Hell, he says this. If you rep I, I, uh, there's only two places to dwell, heaven and hell. And if you're representing the first, heaven, I pray you're representing the way. You know what? Here's the thing, honestly. If we're, if, we're, if we're making the kingdom look stupid, don't tempt me to be a part of it. If you got a little fish on your car, especially if you say shark back the shirt on the back of your car, and you're riding on the road and you got road rage, don't, don't flip people in the bird. And then you ride by and go, oh, they're Christian. Oh, Surely that wasn't a bird. They were just telling me I was number one. 
If you're going to leave somebody a track at a restaurant, I've said this a hundred times, I mean it. If you're going to leave somebody a track at a restaurant, that's great, that's awesome. If you're going to share the word of God with them, you're going to ask them to invite them to church, don't be a cheap tipper. Amen. All the people that have been servers in here in their whole lives and waitresses and waiters. Amen. Amen. Because let me tell you what they're going to do. They're going to be like, mm, 50 cents. Can you raise your kids on 50 cents at the church? <laughs> be the example God's called us to be. His will, not our own. Finally, seek real things. As we look at verse 29 through 31, they saw boldness. They saw boldness in the preaching of God's word. You know what? I can come before the throne today to preach his word boldly because of the fact that he's called me there. It's not a qualify in my life. He didn't qualify me to be a preacher. Amen? To start with. He called me, and then he qualified me. He doesn't call the qualified. Oh, I, I heard this week, and I thought, man, it's so powerful. It is so powerful. Grab a hold of this with me this morning. People say, well, I've got to clean my act up. I've got to get to church to clean my act up. You're never going to give your life to Him. Understand something. You can't fix yourself. I can't fix myself. I couldn't fix my drug addiction. I couldn't fix my alcohol addiction. I couldn't fix all the things in my life that I was completely addicted to. I couldn't, I couldn't change those. God Himself changed into my life. He's powerful. I couldn't get away from it. I couldn't step away from it. As long as I was doing it in my own desires and in my own flesh, I can't change a thing. He changes everything. He created me. And with boldness, I can claim the fact that He is God. So if you've got to fix yourself up before you come before Him, you don't understand what grace means. We're not under the law any longer. The Old Testament, they were under the law. Crystal asked a great question a couple weeks ago. She said to me, she said, do they steal, the ones that don't believe Jesus came, do they steal slaughter animals? Do they still sacrifice animals and all? I said, I, that's a great question. She said, I don't know. I'm not a Jew. I, can't, I don't believe that they would because I believe Peter would be over there knocking on the door and be like, what y'all doing? <laughs> Killing them lambs and all that stuff. But let me tell you this. If you believe that in church today, you need to go get you a whole truck of animals and be back here next Sunday and have this that's not what God said. He said the sacrificial lamb was Jesus Christ. Yes. When his blood was shed on Calvary's hill for you and I, it makes us white as snow. Yes. My sin yesterday, today, and tomorrow is covered. And his grace is sufficient for all sin. That means yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That means my sin that I'm sinning today because I'm still a sinner. Amen? Saved by the grace of God. Yes. Tomorrow I'm going to sin too. And he still covers that up. Oh, that's not a license to free to sin. Oh, go on sin and do whatever you want to do and live however you want to live and God's got you. No, that's not what that word says. It says that we're to do what he's called us to do. Yeah. The way he's called us to do it with boldness. They sought boldness in the preaching. They sought power. They sought power and healing. Listen to what it says in the scripture. <clears throat> it says, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Hold on a minute now. They sought power for man to heal, for Jesus to heal. Stretch out your healing hand. Heal. They sought the healing power of Jesus. That's why you can't change yourself, folks. Honestly, that's why you cannot change your life. That's why you can't clean your act up. He's the one that cleans you up. It's His grace and His mercy. He's the one that heals you. You know what? In all honesty, for real, if, I, if we, we die... And we go, I, I mean, we were talking about it last night. I said, you know, I was teasing Crystal because I said, you want our kids to go with us? <laughs> to Israel, really? I said, I just thought, man, you go to my parents keep the kids and everything. Everything will be fine with your parents keep them, you know. She was like, mm, I want my, if something happens to me, I want my kids to be with me. I said, so let me tell you what I heard you say. If our plane crashes and we die, you want our kids to die too? She was like, yep, I want them to be right there with me. <laughs> I know where we're going. We're going right to heaven. We all going to heaven together. Amen. Yes. Can I tell you the truth in all honesty? If that is God's will, let it be. And I can tell you this too, and I want to be real honest with you this morning. Don't mourn for me. Mourn for yourselves because you're still in this nasty, dirty, rotten world <coughs> who judges people so much, who is hateful as they can be in and out of the church. And I want to share with you this morning too, if you're not a regular church attender, let me tell you this. Nobody in the church has a right to judge you at all whatsoever. Nobody outside the church has a right to judge you at all whatsoever. There's one judge, and that's God. And he judges at death. 
It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment, the scripture says. That means that God judges when we die. So it's not my place or your place to judge somebody else in life. We're to reach him and love him. We're to show the love of Christ to them that he's given to me and you. The forgiveness and the grace that he's given to us. As we seek power for healing in their life, the greatest power you can seek in someone's life is that they be healed from their sin sickness that they're under. Yes, they're still going to sin. No, the scripture doesn't say, every time I sin, i got to come back before and give my life to Christ. You know, you surrender your all to him, and he cleans your act up. Fifteen years later, he's still cleaning my act up. Fifteen years later, when someone cuts me off on the road, I, I suffer with road rage like crazy. That's why I don't have stickers on the back of my car. Amen. God gave me that sovereignty to know. Don't put, uh, bless God, and, oh, but I got liberty stickers on the back. L-U, but they don't know what that means. I got Marine Corps sticker on the back, so when I cut him off, he's like, oh, I know why he cut me off. He's in a hurry, he's mad, and he's, you know, he's got the road rage, and everything, PTSD, and all that, and things that kill people, come like, bam! We'll run you right off the road. God's still dealing with me on that, too. There's things in my life, he's still changing me. He wants to change your life the same way. But you see, they thought, they sought the Holy Spirit finally today. They sought the feeling. Not feeling, F-E-E-L-I-N-G. Not, it's, not, it's not based off your feelings. Praise God, our salvation is based off our feelings because I shared with someone one time, they said, Pastor, I just, I just don't understand. I don't really know if I'm really saved or not. Let me tell you this. If somebody can talk you out of your salvation, you ain't saved. I'm just being real with you. You can't talk me out of mine. You didn't give it to me. But there's days I don't feel like a preacher. There's days I don't feel like a Christian. Praise God that my salvation is not based off of feelings, amen? It's based off the truth that Jesus gave his life for me and he surrendered his all to God for me. And if I surrender my all to God like Jesus did, I'm going to be like Christ. I'm just like him. And you know what? I'm Christ-like, which means I'm guaranteed heaven, amen? It's the most simple thing. It's not a prayer that you pray. It's not a walking down the aisle. It's not a getting on the altar. It's about this. your full surrender is to God. That's what Jesus did. He said, here I am, Lord, take me. And that's what he wants from us. January the 2nd of 2000, I said, here I am, God, take me. As messed up and jacked up and junk as I am, take me, God, and mold me and make me into what you want me to be. And he's still working. He is the potter, and I am his clay. Right. And oh, yes, I suck at doing what he called me to do. But I want to do what he's called me to do until the day he called me on my 13-year-old kid. Reminded me of that two weeks ago before, at, 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 at the Lyft conference. When a man looked at him and said, hey, tell me why you do what you do. He said, if I could save someone's life, then it's worth it all. That's what God's called me to do. I'm going to do it until he calls me home. Can I tell you this morning? I don't save your life. He didn't mean he saves somebody's life. He means that if I open the door for people to see Jesus and meet Jesus like I did, and allow him to change my life, and I surrender my life to God the way he did, if I just open the door and let people see that, God's going to grab a hold of them too. You can't get away from it, friend. The greatest time I've ever had in my life, honestly, is serving the Lord because when you see God changing people's lives, it is powerful. The dis discouraging thing is when you see people looking to man. I can't change your life. You can't change your life. The song Andy Minio sings, Ron turned me on to it. I didn't like it rap music, but Ron turned me on to it. I love it now. That's why he's a youth back. He loves all of it. Andy Minio sings a song and says, you can't stop me. He says in the song, something to defend heaven, man. Even I can't stop me. You know what he said? Even I can't stop me. In other words, I'm my own worst enemy. I'm the sin that's living inside of me. But by the grace and mercy of God flowing through His Son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that He shed for me on Calvary's Hill, and the Holy Spirit that fills my life that I'm filled with every day, delivers me from that. And I want a life that's pleasing to Him and loving for Him and shows Him to everyone more than I want my own will to be done. So we see the believer's actions. And we see the non-believer's actions. But we understand, too, to seek real things. These real things are boldness and witness, power in the name of Jesus, and filling of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize this? That your biggest battle that you face, all you got to do is cry out the name of Jesus. 
The scripture says that, oh, the devil's powerful. Don't, don't, don't discount him at all, okay? He's powerful. He's got demons that work for him in the church and outside the church, amen? But at the name of Jesus, they must flee. Oh, that's powerful. If there's power in the name of Jesus, if all I got to do is say Jesus and they're gone and they flee and the devil's got to get off my back, he has no control over me and people say, oh, the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do it. You see, when I surrender my life to God and I accepted the free gift of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, He lives inside of me. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to seek out the real things. I am filled with the Holy Spirit and where Jesus dwells, Satan cannot dwell. He's defeated. Do you understand that when they buried Him in the tomb, the stone was rolled away? He got up out of the tomb, He stripped the grave clothes off and He folded them and left them right there. What's it mean in Hebrew tradition? We learned it in Easter. What's it mean in Hebrew tradition when they fold the napkin and leave it there? It means I'm coming back. I'm not done eating yet. Amen? Jesus folded his clothes and left him right there. Amen? And he's coming back to take his church home. And then he went to hell and he took the keys. And he stands over Satan. And he rules over Satan. Therefore, Satan has no power over you and I as God's children. Amen? Amen. Seeking the real things that God's called us. Because this is truly what it means be seeking the will of God. I don't know about you, friend, this morning, but you know what? I've sought my will many times in my life, and I still seek my will a lot. God's convicted me this week to seek His will. He knows much better than I do. Oh, yeah, this might be a tough time that you're going through. It might be a terrible time in your family or in your relationships or, or in your friendships, and it may be a struggle you're going through with an addiction. Can I tell you this? He's right in the midst with you. He promised you He'd never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't promise you to be easy. Oh, everybody, that, that health, wealth, and prosperity gospel is a lie. Oh, he just wants the best for you, and everything is so good all the time, and you're never going to have any problems serving Jesus. Really? Let me tell you why that's a lie. Did Jesus have problems? He did, didn't he? Yes. Did Jesus suffer? Yes. yes. If we're like Jesus, we're going to suffer, and we're going to have problems too, Amen. But God promised us He'd never leave us nor forsake us. His will is that He's walking right there with us. His will is, and I believe with all my heart, Crystal said this the other week, and she said, you know what, I believe when I step onto that plane, I believe that the Holy Spirit's presence is going to come over me like a common, like there's no tomorrow. I believe it with all my heart. I don't believe she'll sit there the whole time with tears streaming down her face because if she trusts in God, truly trusts in God the way that God's called us to trust in Him, I don't have to worry at all whatsoever. I know where I'm going. You see, you've got to worry today if you don't know where you would be if death takes your picture. But can I tell you this? According to the Word of God, for real, this is the most true thing you ever hear the Word of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you've done what Romans 10, 9 says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised Him from the dead, I shall be saved. That didn't say I could be. It says I will be. That's a guarantee. That's a that's a. That's a promise that God made us. If I confess with my mouth to you that Jesus is my Lord, if I confess to others that Jesus is my Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised from the dead, I'm going to be saved. And you know what? You can't take that from me because you didn't give it. Amen? Nobody can rob you of your salvation. They didn't give it to you. Secondly, it says that, that all that sin that falls short of God's glorious standard in Romans 3.23. Right? What was His glorious standard? Jesus. Yes, we all fall short. None of us are perfect. And the greatest thing in my favorite scripture, you all know what is it? Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I am not condemned. Amen? Amen. My sin yesterday, today, and tomorrow doesn't condemn me to go to hell because I'm not going there because I got Jesus in me. Amen? And this morning, he wants us to seek his will and not our own. As you stand to your feet this morning, as the praise man comes to close us out this morning, I want to ask you a question. Are you here this morning and need a healing touch from God? Are you here this morning and, you, and you, you, you look through your own will and your own ways and God's convicted you this morning to, hey, you know what? Turn it over to Him. Trust me, He's more than capable of handling it. He's God. Maybe you're here this morning and you never surrendered your life to Him. Today's the day of salvation, the Bible said. Right there in your seat at this altar, I'll be glad to share with you in God's Word how you can know today you're a Christian. Not mine. My, my, my opinion doesn't lead to anything. This right here is what changes your life. Right there in your seat or here, I'll be glad to pray with you. I'll be glad to share with you. Just cry out to God. He's everywhere. The Bible says He's omnipresent, which means He's everywhere. He's omnipotent, which means He's all-powerful. 
He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows your heart and your mind before you ever even speak anything out of your mouth. He already knows you. Don't worry about what people around you think. Worry about what God knows. And you know today whether you're right with him or not. My prayer is that you leave here today different than the way you came here. I know I am. He's still changing me. He's still working in my life. He still loves me. He still gives me grace. He still gives me mercy. He wants us to get it out to everyone else. This morning, God's challenge your heart. This morning, let all this be.
pray a special prayer this morning for anyone here this morning where God is dealing with issues in their life with God. I pray that your anointing power and your Holy Ghost would fill them, Lord Jesus. That they would feel your presence in their life and that they would know, Lord God, you're walking with us through every step of the way. You promised that to us. You promised us you'd hold our hand. You promised us you'd be there with us. You promised us you would carry us when we're, when we're low. You would carry us when we couldn't walk, Lord Jesus. God, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you would work and do work in our lives and that we will be open to the ministry you called us because you called every one of us to serve you. And God, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus this week that we would, you would place people in our lives, Lord God, that need to see you. That we would open the door that they might see you and experience and we'll be experiencing you today. Their life will be changed forever. Help us to be who you called us to be. Help us to be your servants. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Everyone say Amen. Don't forget the Dick is speaking at the uh, Building Grounds Committee meeting right now. We'll meet in the library. And uh, hopefully.